You're listening to Mixed Reality Cabaret on KBeach Radio, 88.1 FM HD3, kbeach.org. This is Glenn Zuckman at the Festival of Books on the campus of the University of Southern California. I'm here with author Raina Graham, author of three books, two works of fiction, and then most recently a nonfiction memoir. Um, 2006, Across a Hundred Mountains, 2009, Dancing with Butterflies, and most recently, 2012, The Distance Between Us. Raina Grand, welcome to Mixed Reality Cabaret. Well, thank you for having me. So, your 2006 book, and then six years later, your new book, the, the first book is a fiction, sort of autobiographically inspired. Yes. And then mm -hmm. the new book is, uh, is a biography, is a memoir. And so I wonder if you could, well, maybe tell me a little about the story and, and the idea. Sure. Yeah, well, Across the Hundred Mountains was meant to be my memoir. Okay. When I started writing it in 98, it was going to be a story about me and my siblings being left behind in Mexico by my parents. So it was going to deal with our own experience of being left behind. But then when I started working on the book, it got very hard to write because having to live through that all over again as I was writing it became very painful, very difficult. So I couldn't do it. And I, I figured that the only way I could really finish this story was to fictionalize it and to create a character to stand in for me. So it wasn't um, technical difficulties, but, but emotional. It was, emo yeah, emotional difficulties. So I created a character and she wanted to tell her own story. So even though uh, Across Hunter Mountains was inspired by my experiences, eventually it just it became its own story and my character went on on her own journey. Because you said she's supposed to do this and she said, no, I'm going to do this. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And you know, it was really hard because I spent like, I think I spent about two years on the same pages because I kept trying to force it to be my story and and it didn't want to be and then once i decided okay this is not gonna be it it's gonna have it a life of its own and juana's gonna go off in her own adventures that's when the story really took off and i wrote the whole thing in about a year so when you when you took your constraints off of it yes it, it just took off so that's what happened with Across the Hundred Mountains. And then um, six years later, you know, after I finished my, my second book, I was still thinking about that memoir that I had wanted to write. And I thought, well, now that I have written two books, I think I have enough writing chops to, to get through it, you know? And then I realized too that I shouldn't run away from the pain. I should use that pain to write the book and to put it all in there. And that's what I did, you know, I, I kind of wrote from that place of, of pain and heartache and it comes across in the book. But it was really wonderful because after I finished it, I felt so free, I felt so liberated. Wow. So I really want to ask you about, um, I'm, I'm really interested in identity and obviously immigration and identity. But let me ask you first about this idea of fiction and non-fiction, which maybe will take us there. Um, you know, it, I don't want, I guess this is a simplistic idea, but I, I sometimes think that we conflate the idea of fact with the idea of truth. That if something is factual, we think it's true or truth in some mm -hmm. deeper sense. And that if something is fiction, we think that it's fake or, or right, somehow less. Right, right, right. Um, and, and yet I kind of feel like it's the opposite, that, you know, I see so many works of fiction that contain these powerful human truths, and there is great nonfiction here today, obviously, but so much nonfiction is, you know, how-to manuals and cookbooks, and, right. and so I find so much truth in fiction that I, I just, I'm wondering how that played for you and the, well, I mean, you, the tr you tried to push one truth onto it, and mm -hmm, your character mm -hmm. pushed back and said, no, I have a different truth, that's not right, my truth. Right, right. Yeah, and it's really interesting because once I let my character have a life of her own, she became so real to me that even today, I'm still, I still think about her and I say, oh, I wonder what she's up to now. Wow. So I guess there are multiple truths yes, in the sense that yes, in, in the case exactly. of the first book, um, you're initial insistence to push to force one truth mm -hmm. actually prevented her from bringing out right a, a new truth. and you know when you read the book even though it's a novel it still gives you a reality that 
that is true to many, many people living in poverty in Mexico and especially you know the children that deal with that situation of being left behind by their parents and everything that happens to them and the emotional traumas all of that are real they are true so even though you know juan is a fictional character there's rep she's representing something that actually exists and another thing to that i added to that to that first book was um, I included a lot of experiences of my own family. So when you read the book and there's a lot of characters in there that are, you know, based on my family and the things that they go through, my family went through them. Um, so those are truths there, even though, you know, I chose to, to write it as a novel. And so after this, you know, sort of lifelong odyssey and, and with, with your 11-year-old son running around as we're sitting here in this, this, you know, beautiful USC campus, I mean, what are your thoughts about immigration, this, you know, this sort of towering issue? Well, I mean, you know, one of the, the, the biggest um, ironies, I would say, for me is that the opportunity that allowed me to get where I am today also denied um, and closed the doors for millions of immigrants. And that was the 1986 amnesty mm. because, you know, it benefited my family. When we got here, um, my father qualified for the amnesty and by 1990 we had our green cards and everything. But then ever since then, you know, the, the amnesty got such a bad rep that pretty much um, politicians or lawmakers didn't want to touch it anymore. And it's been like 20, you know, 27 years since lawmakers said we're going to fix this immigration problem. And now there's a lot more immigrants who are living in the shadows than there were when I first arrived to the U.S. So definitely, it's um, worse. yeah, yeah, it's worse now. And but it's really exciting to hear, you know, that they're they're proposing bills, they're throwing ideas around, they're moving forward with things. And I think definitely this year we're gonna see something happen. So tomorrow I'm, I'm interviewing Lisa C, who's uh, written many books, but among them uh, Shanghai Girls, which uh, deals with them coming from China to, to San Francisco, right, Los Angeles. Right. And you know, it's a different time period, but really the same kinds of problems. They have this Chinese Exclusion Act, right. and, and then they finally get rid of it. And I think they say, oh, now Chinese can come to America. We will allow 100 per year. So it's this like sort of crazy, um, is, is, is America too crowded? I mean, do we need to keep people from everywhere out because they're... No, I think, you know, a lot of times it's just a disconnect with newer generations that they're very disconnected from their past and from their culture. So they forget, you know, they forget that their great-grandparents or grandparents came from somewhere else. And, and I think, I, you know, I, I've seen that also in uh, my own family with the new generations of kids who huh. don't speak, don't want to speak Spanish. Okay. Even my own kids refuse to speak Spanish to me. They understand it, but they don't want to speak Spanish to me. So there's that disconnect that starts to happen with newer generations. And unfortunately, some of them do forget completely that, they, that their ancestors were immigrants too. And um, then they turn around and they start discriminating recent arrivals, which is really not a very kind thing to do. And every immigrant group has faced this kind of discrimination at one point or another in the U.S. You know, I, um, in a, I was an art director at, a, I guess I don't need to say where, but, um, and I had so much trouble dealing with this one guy, and I, I later discovered that um, he was a gay white supremacist and hmm. he hated me for being half Jewish and it was kind of funny that was the first time I because I sort of had this very simplistic idea that oh well if you were oppressed yourself then you would just be this very inclusive tolerant person but no I mean you can hmm. be an oppressed minority and then turn around well, and yeah that's, I mean I, I learned that from my dad I mean you know my dad grew up in a very abusive household hmm. and both of his parents were very abusive and then he turns around and he abuses the hell out of his kids, you know? 
So my siblings and I grew up in that kind of household where we got our butt kicked every single day, basically, and he was extremely abusive. So, you know, that does happen where you, you, you are abused and then you turn around and then you abuse others. So it's important to be aware of that and to break that cycle. So how would you, how would you describe your identity today? My identity today, I would say that I'm pretty um, sure of who I am now and more than I've ever been sure of because um, for many years, especially, you know, when I had just arrived to the U.S., I really struggled with my identity and with trying to find my place in the world and, and figure out where I belonged. And one of the greatest things that my writing has given me is that, that sense of identity, you know, like where I know that I'm Mexican and I'm American and I'm a Mexican-American writer, a Latina writer, and I feel really blessed to have two cultures within me. Um, I think both of my cultures are very beautiful and yes, um, they have flaws, but also they have a lot of wonderful things and I think I have learned so much from living in Mexico, living here, and I really like the person I am today because of that. So how do we build a more tolerant, inclusive world? I think it, you know, it, it begins with uh, different things like the education. It's important to that our textbooks reflect, you know, the diversity so that is here. So your actually has been read in a lot of high schools. Yeah, right? yeah. And, uh, you know, I've been really lucky, but, but uh, still we have a long ways to go, you know, and also we need to be more inclusive. Um, even, even here at the festival, we need to be, include more people of color um, to reflect the fact that, you know, that L.A. is a very diverse community. It's 50 percent Latino, um, yet we don't see that here with uh, writers who are featured. So we need to, to start. So there's a good presence. But there's a good but presence, like but we need more. Yeah. We need more. We need to work more on it because, you know, we have to really embrace our diversity. I think every culture that is here in the U.S. brings something very beautiful to the country. And we shouldn't, you know, turn, turn our backs from that. We should embrace it and, and um, celebrate it. You know, I think, I mean, for me, the, the irony is that, um, you know, obviously we were, we're in a bit of financial trouble in recent times, but all in all, America's had a pretty good global hand for a long time. And we haven't really had manufacturing here for a very long time. Mm -hmm. It's really not so much making objects. It's, it's, our, it's the creativity in this country. And, and I don't think there's anything, you know, that this piece of earth is more creative than some other piece of earth. I mean, I think the reason that we're so creative, I mean, if you look at, you know, Apple Computer now, the number one market cap company on the face of the earth, I mean, they make nice electronics, but I think the design is a really significant part of what's going on. And I think, you know, whether it's them or, or whether it's Silicon Valley up north or Hollywood down here, that that creativity is the result of diversity. Yes. Uh, you know, when you go out to Venice Beach a few miles from here and you see so many different cultures smashed up against each other that, that I, I think America's strength is in the diversity and yet right. somehow we're always uncomfortable with that. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, we're always afraid, you know, we're always afraid of of what's different of the other but I think that where we have to start is to know that basically you know first of all we're all human beings so we're one people and there's no no reason why we have to start you know um, shutting doors and saying no you stay out because you're different from me so you you called yourself a, a Mexican-American author mm -hmm. uh, but also a Latina or also a woman author um, and I'm wondering, and you mentioned also, you know, sort of, a, a, we've talked about abuse a little bit and oppression, and is, is writing something that specifically has empowered women, I mean, I guess it would empower anyone, but that, that you know, so many cultures that have that been oppressive toward women, and, and is, is right. writing sort of a special way to, to escape or to discover yourself? Well, I mean, to me it is, and I think from what I've seen of other Latina writers, it's definitely a way for us to have our voices heard. Uh, we've come a long way, you know, Latina writers, from, from many years, you know, like a few decades ago, 
we weren't really getting published. Uh, we had, you know, a lot of wonderful writers like Sandra Cisneros, for example, uh, Denise Chavez, Ana Castillo, Julia Alvarez, who were trying really hard to get their, their works published, and, and they weren't. And they had to really, like, break down those walls and, you know, have their voices heard and look where they are now. And because of their success, because of what they've done, now the new generation of writers such as myself, I've had it much easier to get my work published. And I believe that, you know, everything I'm doing with my writing, I'm also paving the path for the next generation of writers who are, who are coming behind me. And so it all works out in that way, you know, where every, every little thing that you do is gonna benefit the next generation. So it's important to work really hard, um, have, you know, high standards for your work, for your writing, and to make sure that when you succeed, you don't shut that door, you leave it open and you help the next generation. So you have to be good. Yes, you have to be good. <laughs> so, so everybody has to be good, but if, people, if somebody doesn't want you in, then you have to. You have really to be have extra to be good. good. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, with Latino writers, you know, you gotta be more Mexican than the Mexicans and more American than the Americans. So is that? Uh, I mean, that's an interesting. I, you know, I always thought about Muammar Gaddafi, who so many people sort of thought was crazy, but I always thought that he actually did a pretty impressive job for a long time of. He had to give speech after speech where if he went a little too far one way, Hamas was going to overthrow him. And if he went a little too far the other way, the United States was going to bomb him. And somehow, you know, he stayed in power for a few decades. That's pretty impressive. Yes. And, and as, a, as a Latina American author, do you find that sort of pressure that you have these two different audiences that you try to speak to at the same time? Yeah, yeah, sometimes, you know, you have to be careful sometimes about how you write or what you write about and um, yeah, I mean, definitely I think, uh, you know, people are looking at you and they're, you know, judging you, they're quick to judge, so uh, you do have to be careful, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty aware, you know, that I'm here representing the Latino community and as such I have to, to be responsible and I have to um, do my best. To, to do a good representation of my people so that when, you know, when people look at me, they know that I'm representing the Latino community and to know that we are very smart, very talented, very hardworking. So 2006, 2009, 2012, new, new book in 2015? <laughs> I know, uh, yeah, I hope so, yeah. Uh, definitely just happens that way you know but I do spend I spent four years I have spent four years on each of my books and I'm trying to get a little faster but I'm a, I'm a hardcore perfectionist and I, I really do labor over every single word that goes into my manuscripts so it takes me a while to get it right and uh, but I'm really happy I don't want to rush it because so far I think I have done pretty good with my books and it's working out for me too to be slow and steady, but um, you know, to make sure everything is good. So have you started a new? Yeah, yeah, I've thing? started, yeah. Have you yeah. said what it is? Are you uh, a little bit, I'm still kind of, you know, getting to know my characters, getting to know the story. So you're going and back to fiction. I am going back to fiction. I'm going to a novel and judging from what happened with my other, you know, two novels, it's like, I can start with one idea and by the time I finish it, it's going to be something completely different. So, but I'm exploring my characters and, and I'm having fun with it. I'm glad to be back to, to fiction, actually. Well, I guess that was a little bit what I was thinking of with that idea of truth and fact that, um, you know, so, so many people who talk about crafting maybe it's more of a Hollywood idea, but um, that, uh, you know, you you design where it's going to end and then you write to get there and, and and in some senses that makes sense but it seems like if the characters are really going to be alive that you mm -hmm. can't know right that, that they have to have the opportunity actually, to tell you you're going a different way yeah you know i mean the way i write i don't know where it's going all i have is characters maybe just one character and uh, a premise and then after that i start writing and I explore as I go and I never know what's gonna happen next. It just happens, you know, the more, the, the further I get into the story, I let it guide me and my character tells me where, it wants to, where she, he or she wants to go 
and pretty soon you know that I'm, I'm going somewhere I just don't know where I'm gonna end up but to me that's what's fun about about the process of you know discovering the story well you've left us lots to enjoy while we're waiting for the new uh, journey oh well thank you uh, Raina Graham, thanks so much for visiting Mixed Reality Cabaret. Thank you, and I invite our listeners to go to my website at reinagrande.com.